Welcome to Badminton Unlimited, your weekly access to badminton action and beyond. This week, we report on the extraordinary badminton success story of the tiny island nation of the Seychelles. And we spend the afternoon with the Robsons, the legendary badminton couple of New Zealand. The Seychelles is an archipelago of 115 islands in the Indian Ocean off East Africa. With a population of just over 90,000 people, it's the smallest African country. But despite its petite size, the Seychelles is one of the top badminton nations on the continent. The sport didn't always enjoy the success and popularity it has today. 20 years ago, badminton was relatively unknown, but the arrival of a foreign coach from the Far East changed everything. In 1995, Luo Guohui arrived in the Seychelles as part of a coaching aid program between China and Africa. My overseas assignment from the China Sports Federation was the Seychelles. As I was not familiar with the country, I inquired and found out that the Seychelles was a beautiful place one of the world's most idyllic tourist destinations. So I went there with a sense of adventure, and that was the start of my beautiful journey in the Seychelles and Africa. In his 15 years, he has transformed the fortunes of the sport in the Seychelles, steering the tiny country to 10 All-Africa Games titles. Badminton Unlimited caught up with the Seychelles Badminton team where they were in Dongguan recently for the Sudirman Cup. They told us how they went from unknowns to African champions. At that time, we were talking about weightlifting, football, volleyball. You know, there were no actually attention on badminton. Badminton was just... Uh, uh, just a name, just a name. But as soon as, like I said, he came, the transition of the sports began. You know, the development of the sport. Gradually, slowly by slowly, they, 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 they focus on badminton. Very much a low-level sport with only amateur players and poor infrastructure, it was the opposite of what Law was used to coming from a badminton superpower. Tasked with passing on China's badminton expertise and growing the sport, he started from scratch, focusing on a small group of young players. In the Seychelles, they start training at a late age, unlike in China. Our kids start at six or seven years old. For them, it's about 14 years of age. Their badminton techniques are also not well developed for that age. So when I came in, I started with the basics the right way to hold the racket, how to attack, how to smash, and proper footwork. I started with individual lessons first and then moved on to group sessions. One of the first things Law did was to put in place a proper training structure. He implemented the training regimes and practice routines widely used in China. For the Seychelles players, it was a culture shock at first. It was hard tough because it was a new new training, new techniques and through him I have learned a lot. Despite sometimes we were very angry with his training because he likes repetition, repetition, repetition but it was, it, was, uh, it was good for us. I've met coaches in my life but I think he's the best. Coach Law's disciplined and regimental training raised the standard of badminton and very quickly started to reap results. Our first success with him came in 1996, 90, I think, yeah, in the Junior Indonesian Games, which we, we did very well. We got men's singles gold, ladies' doubles gold, men's doubles gold, team event gold, and this was his first major success for him. So that was the open door for badminton, and we kept, we kept going on. Their successes at the Africa Badminton Championships since the turn of the century has been nothing less than remarkable. They have medaled in all categories and have turned the country into a badminton power on the continent. One of my strategies was to focus on the women's team. This is one of the ways in China. I had the men train with the women. In this way, the female players are pushed harder. 
It raised their standard and they improved faster as well. With this, Juliet won her first Africa Championship women's singles title in 2002. Applying the same for the mixed doubles, we had them train with the men's doubles. That also saw vast improvement and our mixed doubles also won the gold. In 2007, Babington brought Seychelles a first for the tiny nation, a gold at the All-Africa Games. Juliet Awan and Georgie Kupidon created history when they won the mixed doubles title in Algiers. You know, to win, to win a medal in Africa, it was very, very hard. I just, we just stood there, look at each other, and then we just, you know, we screamed because, you know, it, it's a dream. Seychelles also made its first Olympic badminton appearance in 2008. Georgie Kupidon was the flag bearer in Beijing. It's a testament to how far badminton has grown in the country. Olympic is the highest and biggest game in the world. And to be a flag bearer, you must be, I think, the best athlete in your country. It's the first time that a badminton player came as a flag bearer. When we stepped on court in Beijing, the then China president Hu Jintao and the Seychelles president stood up in acknowledgement. I felt proud to lead the Seychelles team as it's our badminton knowledge that's helped them here and felt I've done my part for China in passing on that knowledge. Though Coach Law returned to China in 2010, his heart is still very much with Seychelles badminton. He continues to be part of the coaching setup, offering his services at major tournaments. Even if he's not back home with us, he's always, always ready to help us in every way that he can. So for that we are so grateful and we thank, thank him a lot for still sticking with the Seychelles team. Seychelles badminton is a miracle made in China. The sport continues to flourish built on the foundations implemented by Luo Guohui. Seychelles may be small, but it's a giant in African badminton. It's time for some trivia. Did you know? Between the years of 1949 and 1967, the United States was one of the dominant teams in global badminton, especially in the women's format. They won a total of 23 All England titles in that period. The women's team was also Uber Cup champions for three consecutive editions of the tournament in 1957, 1960 and 1963. Asian food, uh, pasta. Indonesia uh, open? Yes, yeah, same for me. I used to say Vita Marissa. Um, for me, it's Martin. She's great. <laughs> Politics and acting like I'm really smart. <laughs> I would say just badminton and the, just to get the attention for the sport. We always need to play yeah. in, in white because we won five tournaments mm. in a row in white. So yeah, that's true. When I say to Avia, okay, which shirt do you want to play in? She always says white. <laughs> Not from the first round, but <laughs> later rounds. Later on. So, quarter or semi. Then I want to wear, wear white and white. <laughs> Superpower that I'm so strong. I would like to fly, it would be awesome. <laughs>
We find out about the development of badminton in Iran when we get back. One of the more rewarding aspects of large regional tournaments is the opportunity to meet players and nations outside the power centers of the sport. This proved to be the case at the recently completed Badminton Asia Championships held this year in Wuhan, China. Away from the media attention of the elite countries, we caught up with some of the players from Iran. I'm Farzin Khanjani from Iran. I'm 20 years old and I play men's single. Hello, I'm uh, Soraya Agai Hajiaka, uh, 19 years old from Iran. Farzin and Soraya, just two of the players from the Middle Eastern country traveling throughout Asia playing tournaments as they build up the necessary experience they hope will help in their development. Events like the Badminton Asia Championships not only offers them motivation, but gives them some sense of how far they need to go to reach their goals. When I come and I see the stadium, it's very nice. I see best players in the world and I just every time see the match and uh, I just thinking I must improve. I have to improve and I must learn something from here. But that is really nice feeling. Actually, I never seen somebody like Lindan or like Leung Dai and never seen and I'm really happy to see them. and. I will watch every moment and every match of this tournament to improve myself. Iran is considered the best badminton nation in the Middle East. But in truth, the sport is relatively weak in this region and the country's shuttlers are keen to improve their status. Uh, Iran badminton, if you look to other countries in West Asia, we are the better team and we are the best team usually. And But we are training and we are trying for our shield players and to getting better and for next, we can be better in Badminton Asia, not only West Asia, we, we are trying. In terms of the sporting pecking order, Badminton has a large participation level, but only recreationally. It lags behind football and wrestling as a professional sport, but there are signs that things are beginning to change. The country has its own international challenge event and players are traveling abroad in greater numbers. After my federation sent us to so many tournaments, so now um, women's more like the badminton. And now, for example, my friends in a school, when they see me, I play in other countries and I can get medals. So they very excited and they start play badminton. Another benefit of traveling to play abroad is that shuttlers get to train with players from other genders. Because of religious restrictions, men and women are not allowed to train or play together in Iran. We have training morning and afternoon session, but we only do training girl national team with uh, women coach. And after uh, we finish training and men have training, afternoon also same. 
but when they are abroad, they are permitted to mix. This brings them in line with other nations who constantly use male and female combinations in order to develop the different skills and techniques the women and men's games offer. Iran has a long way to go, but they have young and enthusiastic players who are being exposed to major international tournaments. With the rapid progress of badminton across the globe, the landscape of the sport is set to change. Iran is hoping to be a part of that new scenery. The sixth BWF World Super Series tournament came to a conclusion last week at the BCA Indonesia Open. The event is considered by many to have the best crowds on the international circuit, and they certainly had plenty to shout about this time round. Up first was the mixed doubles finals. It pitted the top two seeded pairings, Ma Ting and Xu Chen, up against Zhang Nan and Zhao Yunlei. These two pairings have been involved in some epic battles in the past, but this wasn't one of them. In a match that lasted 45 minutes, Ma and Xu cruised to a rare victory against their compatriots in straight games 21-17, 21-16. Into the women's singles as Thailand's Rachanok Intanon took on Yui Hashimoto. The Japan shuttler had beaten her opponent in the Star Australian Open the week before and was in a confident mood, but that was shattered in emphatic fashion. Intanon dominated the match, running away with it as she triumphed 21-11, 21-10. The men's singles final up next as Yano Jorgensen took on Japan's Kento Momota. The Dane came into the match as the reigning champion and quickly established his territory as he took the first game 21-16. But in Momota, Japan has talent of note, and he showed his appetite for a battle. He leveled the match in a closely fought second. With momentum with him, he sailed through the third to grab the win 16-21, 21-19, 21-7. The crowd got their first and only Indonesian finalist of the day as Grisha Poli and Nitya Krishinda Maheswari took on China's Tang Jinghua and Tianqing in the women's doubles. The home favorites had defeated two Chinese pairings on the way to the final and were looking for a fairy tale ending. But it wasn't to be. Tang and Tian made easy work of their opponents as they won it 21-11, 21-10. Last up, it was the men's finals. Ko Song Hyun and Shin Bik Chol took on China's Fu Haifeng and Zhang Nan. The Koreans haven't played together much this season, but it didn't show in the first as they took it 21-16. Fu and Chang reversed the score in the second to level the match. The third was brutal, with neither willing to give ground. But it was the world champions who eventually broke clear to take it 21-16, 16-21, 21-19. It was a fitting match to end the tournament. The World Super Series takes a bit of a rest, but there will be plenty more action happening on the BWF circuit in the coming weeks. We catch up with New Zealand's legendary badminton couple, Jeff and Heather Robson, after the break.
This week's Player of the Week is Kento Momota. The 20-year-old snatched the crown from the head of Jano Jorgensen at the Indonesia Open. Japan's wonder kid continues to show the form and results that has marked him out as a special talent. The win in Jakarta takes his World Super Series victory count to two this season. We're confident it won't be his last. New Zealand may not be a powerhouse in the world of badminton, but they certainly have a power couple in their midst. This legendary couple is well known in the badminton community for their tireless efforts to promote the sport, both in their country and internationally. Meet Jeff and Heather Robson. The Robsons were prominent players in the 50s and 60s. Heather was one of three New Zealand women to ever play in the semis of the All England Women's Singles and was a 1960 Uber Cup semi-finalist, the first for a New Zealand team. Jeff was amongst the top 10 men's singles shuttlers in the world and the captain of the Thomas Cup side. The Robsons were not only skillful in badminton, but they were also exceptional tennis players, enjoying a successful career in both sports. Badminton Unlimited paid Jeff and Heather Robson a visit during a sunny winter's day in Auckland. We sat down over drinks with the soft-spoken couple as they shared with us their passion for the sport and how they made it work as a couple on court. Oh, generally, generally it worked quite well yes, uh, because yes. we played tennis mixed doubles and badminton mixed doubles. Mm. But um, no, we sort of worked things out um, and there were no real problems. Sometimes I used to get mad. She used to tell me what to do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time, but no, it worked all right. Jeff and Heather's love for the sport goes beyond the competition. Both are very active administrators, having been president of the New Zealand Badminton Federation and the Auckland Badminton Association. Jeff was on the International Badminton Federation for 25 years and Heather, together with a key figure in Australia badminton, Roy Wards, started the Oceania Badminton Confederation. Roy became the secretary and Heather became the president of Oceania Badminton. So and you, and you held that for how many years? About 14. About 14 mm. years. Mm. Uh, so that sort of got Oceania going, of course it, now it's, it's going quite well. Now it's but Oceania is a, a difficult area because it takes in all the islands and they're widespread. To get to them, it's not like just driving down the road for half an hour. Um, it, it's a very difficult organisation, but it's grown and it's, it's become quite a strong organisation now. On the local front, to encourage the growth and to raise the standard of New Zealand badminton, the Robsons established a trust fund, providing financial aid to the country's shuttlers. Uh, and we've been, been very fortunate with some um, previous internationals who are able to assist, uh, they've contributed to the fund. So it's still only a small fund, but the players are always very grateful if we can give them a small sum to help them with coaching or to a bit of travel. Uh, they're very grateful indeed. And this is an extra to what, what anything New Zealand Baden Federation does. Um, now, let's see, I think it was... Both international and local organisations have recognised the Robsons' contribution to badminton. Both have received a number of accolades for their work. Jeff was also awarded an MBE for his services to badminton and tennis. And you feel you're not looking for these things, you feel very uh, humble when you get acknowledged in doing something like that because you're not doing it for that reason at all. I got a big surprise when I got my BWF award for lifetime achievement, I think it was called, and it came as a big surprise to me. I didn't, you know, know anything about it coming, but it, um, I, I felt, you know, very proud to have received it. Although in their 80s, the Robsons are still going strong. They are currently working alongside another of New Zealand's former shuttlers, Richard Purser, to set up a badminton museum a project that started three years ago. Previously, I think we had been thinking of uh, setting up a, a room with the memorabilia in it, uh, perhaps in the Auckland Badminton Hall, if that was going to be suitable. But uh, having seen the, the museum in um, Milton Keynes in England and how they had the cabinets and the uh, 
pictures and frames all displayed right through the complex where the public was passing all the time. That impressed me straight away and I thought this is what a museum's got to be like for us. Historical items and memorabilia that have been collected are currently kept in the Robsons' home, from wooden records dating back to the 1920s to sporting attire, photographs and trophies. We've got blazer, we've got a blazer from uh, a lady, Nancy Fleming, who was in the first New Zealand team, which was in 1938. She was also involved in encouraging Mrs Uber to present the Uber Cup. And she worked very hard with Betty Uber to encourage that happening from the IBF, because there was a Thomas Cup for the men, but the ladies were left out. <laughs> and Nancy helped there. We were very conscious that if we didn't do something or someone else didn't do something, something, some items and important historical items would be just lost forever. And that's what we've tried to do to get some of these items and so as they are there and they will remain uh, visible to people over, over the years. Jeff and Heather Robson, two well-respected figures in badminton, not only in New Zealand, but across the globe. Their tireless efforts to promote the sport and their continuous contribution to the growth of the game has paved the way for those who have followed. Let's find out what's happening on the international circuit with our Badminton Unlimited calendar. Next week on Badminton Unlimited, we sit down with Indonesia's number one women's doubles duo, Gracia Poli and Nitya Krishinda Maheswari, as they talk about finding the right formula for success.